Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Practice-Based Publishing, Getting Your Public Health Findings Out into the World, Part 4, Discussion and Submission. My name is Donnie Zemmel, and I'm the Project Coordinator with the Region 5 Public Health Training Center. The Region 5 PHTC is part of the National Public Health Learning Network. With nine other training centers across the country, we seek to strengthen the skills of the current and future public health workforce through training and student development. We encourage you to check out our other training offerings at rvphtc.org. This webinar is offered in partnership with the Journal for Public Health Management and Practice Direct and the American Public Health Association Health Administration section. This final webinar in our four part series will explore how to write about your findings and how to submit your article to the appropriate journal. So just some quick housekeeping items before we get started. This webinar is being recorded and all participants are in a listen only mode. Please add your questions or comments into the chat box. We will not be using the Q&A or raise hand functions during today's webinar. Depending on the question, we may type an answer back to you or we may save it for Q&A at the end. We'll do our best to get to as many questions as possible. The slides were sent out earlier today and there is no CE offered for the training. And the recording and slides will be available in the coming weeks and we'll send out a notification once it's ready. Now I'd like to welcome JP Leiter, Senior Lecturer in the Division of Health Policy and Management at the University of Minnesota School of Public Health. JP is also an editorial board member at JPHMP. Now I'll turn it over to JP to introduce our presenters and get us started today. Thanks, Donnie, and thanks to all of you for being here with us today in our final session in our four-part series. As Donnie said, if you hadn't, haven't seen the uh, other sessions, I'd invite you to. We walk through different aspects of practice-based publishing, and we are on our final part. So today, I'm really pleased that we have Dr. Les Beitch and Oscar Allen here with us. Um, so Dr. Beitch is a professor and um, I would say uh, pracademic um, in, in the strictest sense, uh, having led several health departments over the, the past several years. And, and Dr. Allen is the Chief of Program and Services at NHO. We'll also be hearing from Dr. Moore, uh, the Associate Editor at JPHMP. And um, let's, let's get right into it. Next slide, please. So for those of you who weren't able to join us for the last webinar, we worked through uh, methods and results. And what we, what we wanna do now is just kind of recap uh, where we are at the, the writing process. So having started with our first lecture in, uh, in the series, really working through what, what is practice-based publishing, um, how do you identify the, the right journal, start to think about your topic, and then moving in webinars uh, two and three uh, through kind of the introductory and background writing and, and now into the methods and results. What I think is really critical as we go into discussion um, and, and talking about how, how do we do that in the practice-based context or for, for practitioners, um, just, just thinking about how that works from a per, peer review perspective. It's really important to keep in mind that methods and results are, are part of the core of the paper um, that, that lets you communicate both the, the kind of rigor and, and how you're doing um, what you're doing, and then talking about what you find. So in the discussion today, you'll hear us talk about how do you represent those results and then how do you begin to translate those results into practice and policy. Next slide. Today, we, we have several learning objectives, including uh, talking about how to translate uh, relevance, thinking about challenges and opportunities when we're working through discussion, conclusion, and then finally submission. So one of the things that I think can be really challenging the first time or the first few times uh, that you go through submitting to a peer review journal is that there's a whole process associated with it. You have to get a bunch of forms uh, put together. You have to have information on any co-authors. And so we're gonna talk through that a little bit as well, as well as describe how we think specifically about practice, practice relevance for journals and submission. Next slide, please. Uh, with that, Dr. Allen, over to you. Thank you very much. So um, my section of today's presentation covers uh, around getting practice-based work uh, submitted um, and, and its value to public health. Next slide. 
So first, just to give you the context, um, I uh, hail from NACHO, which is the National Association of County and City Health Officials, which represents the 3,000 county uh, and city local health departments uh, that are really focused on providing frontline work, uh, especially as it pertains to strengthening and advocating and, and providing uh, healthy communities uh, for both for now and in the future. Next slide. So. When you think about that framework, also recognize that there's a great landscape in what the governmental public health departments look like. You can have rural communities, you can have uh, suburban frontier communities, as well as large urban centers. And when you look at this particular landscape, I, I wanted to really paint that picture because those that are in those that are in the the front line of public health are actually dealing with a lot of uh, both uh, material and, and 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 opportunities to really enhance their work and we. We'll talk to the benefit of publishing and why that work does need to be placed uh, in some form of a print-wise format. Next slide. So to that context, I uh, kind of are utilizing the 10 essential public health services, which have been revamped to really center uh, the role of equity. But as we look at this lens from the lens of public health practitioners, uh, we kind of call this the 10 commandments, right? Of how we conduct our work on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, each of these fundamentally provide us with both the experience and the practice and the ability and the know-how uh, to be able to really illustrate the value of interventions and strategies that truly can enhance the work that's being done on that public health landscape. So specifically, however, we recognize that there's the value towards research uh, as well as quality improvement, which is a key facet in this, in this landscape. Next slide. So with that all said, why should public health departments and those of you who are spe specifically from local health, why should you publish or what is the benefit to this uh, level of detail? So first, it's important to own your own story. I spent 16 years as a local epidemiologist, uh, was able to publish a number of articles uh, about work that we did, whether it is disease control interventions or strategies around uh, tobacco uh, and, uh, and the ability of using community-based approaches. But owning your own story gives you the opportunity to not only showcase the good work that you've done, but also illustrate the value that it has impacted on the community and by virtue of that, the practice-based uh, community as well. And it's also important to tell your story. I can guarantee you, oftentimes when you don't write your own story or tell your own story, others do it for you. Uh, and in the case of local health departments, that oftentimes ends up at a federal entity or a state-based agency taking your data and write in the, and get it published. Uh, and at best, and this is not to cause any uh, alarm, uh, but at best you being relegated to a footnote. But the other aspect of the value of publishing, especially from the practitioner level, from a local governmental perspective, is that you have this opportunity to learn from others. This is the beauty of practice-based evidence and practice-based sharing. And the also this other tenet, which is the ability to contribute to that collective knowledge base for pract of practice and for the benefit of others. So whether I'm at a local health department in a small rural community, by being able to illustrate how uh, the work that I was able to accomplish uh, can be both uh, canonized in a, pub in a published format, I know it can benefit another uh, health jurisdiction that may be in the Northeast or maybe in the Southeast or even from a global lens. So there's this significant value that I think we should never underscore, or I should say, we should never understate uh, with respect to uh, the value of publishing. Next slide. So what are the other implications? We also know that publishing does impact the practice and policy initiatives that are really required from our public, from our total, uh, I would say global as well as national lens. You see, when you share results on interventions that have been proven effective with that evidence to support them, that helps inform policy and practice. When you have that evidence to basically not only show the success and more importantly, especially for those who are on the leadership and administration side of the coin, illustrating that return on investment, this points to the significant value of both the work, the staff time, as well as the resources that have been put into the day-to-day -day activities illustrated in this particular publishing, or I should say a peer review um, article based um, perspective. Now, the data and the research also helps us 
understand our world of public health, our interactions, and help also encourage us to make better informed decisions. Was this thing published? Was it supported by peers? And do we see the reproducibility or the ability for others to take it off the shelf and bring it into life in their own jurisdictions? So as local health officials, we recognize this data also allows us to measure the progress in time, looking at uh, emergent trends, and also understanding how we compare against others in a variety of ways. Uh, and publishing basically informs much of what our community health improvement plan is. One of the things that I did as a local epidemiologist was have to was a, uh, having to write the community health assessment as well as the community health improvement plan. And the value of both the data that I had in hand, in addition to what others were able to illustrate, uh, whether it is by focus group assessment, you know, direct surveys, whatever the data collection efforts were, they lent that credibility for the policy decisions and the positions that we had, in addition to the support for why we needed uh, these key uh, programmatic, programmatic areas funded or these key um, projects uh, really uh, supported to enhance our, our, our outcomes and total goal. Next slide. So there's another aspect of this, which I kind of call the LHD brand and why that matters. You see local health departments, and yes, I'm biased, I'm speaking to the local health uh, uh, practitioners in this sense. They provide those essential services to the community, yet their work often goes unnoticed and underfunded. Granted, we now have an opportunity, especially with the uh, current uh, policy initiative for funding to really provide some insurgents in building the public health infrastructure. But before that and before COVID, we had significant impacts around being underfunded. So while the public may value prevention and other activities, oftentimes because their stories weren't being published, they weren't being presented, they were being displayed, the public never made that connection to the work that you're doing in the local, uh, local health perspective. So the ability to generally succeed in proving those health outcomes, this raises the visibility and increases the value of the public, your stakeholders, your partners, your policymakers, uh, and it also helps to the extent raise your brand. So given the differences that I articulated before around the several population dynamics, their demographics and their needs, we recognize that the ability to publish also uh, calls to a greater need to be represented in the written research, in the written evidence. Next slide. So I do have to recognize that there are challenges. Uh, and to be honest, you know, they are succinct and I'll try my best to walk through them as slowly as possible. The first is time. As a local health practitioner, I can tell you who has time, you know, whether you're dealing with, you know, hundreds of diseases that needs to be followed, you know, thousands of clients, if you're providing uh, clinical based um, you know, care, um, or even the prevention activities, the time is always uh, a, a, a resource or a luxury that you never have. Then there's the ad, the ad access to resources. You know, do you have the right resources to help you both uh, provide both the context, the, the value, the, the written capacity? You know, are those resources available to you in order to really support your ability to publish? And then you have time again, right? The ability to now not only navigate uh, the amount of effort that it will take to both submit, uh, both to create uh, and, and to plan out, you know, how does time really come into that play on top of the other issues that we've talked before? And then there's that of prioritization. As we know, especially now, as we look in the age of COVID, our priorities have been set. You've been trying to track and trace both individuals who are contacts of COVID, uh, as well as uh, dealing with school based and other business based return for, um, for activities in addition to testing. Uh, and of course, following through now on the vaccination efforts, where do you have the priorities to set on top of those other essential public health services to really afford yourself that opportunity to prioritize writing and publishing your work for publication, which brings us back to time. Um, and I know it sounds tongue in cheek, but I'm really trying to underscore the point. And then you have the value of the skill set and the workforce. Do you have the capacity in-house to be able to both uh, afford the time and the energy, as well as the skills that are going to be important to invest in an individual or key number of individuals to write your stories, to submit for peer publications, and to continue that effort for that continual improvement. Next slide. 
So I also want to caution that one of the uh, key areas that I think or key mistakes that have been made uh, in this landscape is that, uh, and I saw this from my own uh, side, where there's differences in writing and how you prepare and how you develop yourselves for this uh, degree of activity. So for example, we recognize that people in public health are always focused on crafting better messages that can be tailored to either policymakers or to different individuals or populations. And we recognize that there's a fundamental need to meet people where they're at when communicating complex issues like health disparities or using words or, or forms or phrases that address both cultural and competency uh, in, the, in, the, in an effort to really take home your prevention message. Next slide. But here's where additional difference comes into play. There's a difference between publishing and grant writing. And I can't explain how many times we've seen the decisions made. Well, in order to, sub to, um, to submit for a publication, we'll have the person who writes our regular grants, you know, have them do the writing. Uh, maybe someone in health education, maybe the epidemiologist, maybe someone else who writes the reports. Let's have them do it. Now, Grant writing application is oftentimes the complete opposite of what is required for writing a manuscript, as you would have seen from previous discussions in the previous webinars. In a manuscript, you think about it this way. The objective is to present a scholarly summary of what has been already done with arguments by the author to support those for the validity of the conclusions that are being reached. Whereas a grant application, you're actually trying to convince your fund an agency with your very much persuasive arguments that this work is what needs to be done and why the methodologies will be valuable. Two different things. Next slide. So to that extent, we recognize that there are significant opportunities for success. You must at first develop a strategy for publishing peer review literature, understanding how to structure it, how to plan it, how to execute it, all of the things that will be important for this type of this type of approach will be invaluable for strategy development. Then understand you must remember the underlying motivation of readers. Most individuals are looking to read published manuscripts because they want to, which is a much different from that of reading grant proposals because they have to. And also create that time and space for the writing of those publications, which can be tied into the ability for staff development uh, and staff training. Uh, you can put that as part of uh, the individual performance review. Um, expect to and evaluate uh, both the opportunities for success when you submit and also rejections, because oftentimes you will be rejected, which brings me to the last and the most salient point, the value of never giving up. So I want to thank you and I will pass it on to our next uh, speaker in this uh, session. Thank you, Dr. Allen. And I appreciate your focus on time because you talk so much more quickly. I have more of it now, which is in contrast to those of you who have no time to actually write your papers. So can we have the next slide, please? So I wanna give you a sense of, just like Dr. Allen was giving you the perspective of a former local epidemiologist and uh, a senior member of, of the NACHO staff talking about local public health. I wanna to talk to you from the perspective of someone who has been an editor for the American Journal of Public Health, a board member of the Journal of Public Health Management and Practice. And like all of you over time, you're gonna read hundreds of papers. And I want to at least call out to you to take time to become a peer reviewer for some of those organizations, whether it's the Journal of Public Health Management and Practice or American Journal of Public Health or any of hundreds of other journals out there. Reading how other people put their articles, their manuscripts together, and obviously we're talking about discussion, um, but how they do those things is really the best teacher in my view for how you might craft your own work. Uh, and as Dr. Leiter suggested, I, I'm also a pracademic and, and I look at that from a couple of different perspectives. So I've been uh, in, in senior leadership roles in a couple of different states and actually survived both of those. Uh, I've been the medical director of a large uh, local health department in the distant past, and now I'm on the faculty in, uh, in a college of medicine. And one of the pracademic kind of pieces that becomes so important to the conversation that we need to be thinking about is all the rage in medicine is about translation. It's about the time it takes to go from the bedside to get, excuse me, to go from 
the uh, from the laboratory to get the consequences of the results of those new discoveries to the bedside. And in medicine, that averages about 17 years. And if you think about practice-based publication, the kind of thing that you're gonna be able to do and that Dr. Allen just told you about, it's all about translation and you're reducing the time it takes for newfound knowledge to be literally at the bedside. And the bedside for us is at the community, right? For those of us in public health. So that's a really big deal. And that's the other sort of often neglected hidden benefit of being publishing as a practitioner. Um, we're certainly emphasizing the practice role in that translation. Next slide, please. So I wanna share just a few hundred rules of thumb and uh, I tend to use hyperbole a lot, so uh, which makes it fun for me, but bear in mind that I do use hyperbole. But I'm gonna echo some things you already have heard that your manuscript is a story. And as Dr. Allen said, you can tell your own story or someone else is gonna tell it for you. But I think you've gotta think of your entire manuscript as a story from the introduction, through the methods and results, and finally to the discussion itself. And the discussion is the part that is where you put personality, your personality, your team's personality into your paper. But you know, there are limits to that. For example, I, I know I'm a, of an earlier generation, this was uh, made clear to me by Donnie when I said, avoid O. Henry's surprise endings. And she said, who's O. Henry? So o. Henry is the, an author of many millions of short stories that often had stunning and surprising endings. The Ransom of Red Chief is one of my all-time favorite stories. But, and so if you're writing a paper, you want it to be personable. You want it to have context, but you want it to be logical. If the end that you get to is an o. Henry surprise ending, you really haven't done your job. I've said the discussion should mirror the results and that is in a bunch of different ways. It's as you lay it out, it should follow the same flow that you had in results. And so if you're discussing table one, the th items in table one should be the first thing that you discuss in your discussion that you have in the discussion. Table two, figure three, in other words, go in the same typical order. Um, the length, in my view, should also be comparable to, to the uh, results section in your paper. So when you add up your figures and tables and, and, and the amount of words that you use, your discussion should be that length and not longer. It can always be shorter. And if you're finding that you're not doing that or your discussion is too, too long, you're probably exaggerating the findings that you have from your paper and the significance of them, or may possibly be. So one way to guard about that is when you're doing the discussion is to hit the salient findings, not every finding. And that should happen literally in your first paragraph of a discussion. What's the main thing that made this paper this paper and not another one? What did you learn? What did you find? That's that almost a topical sentence of that first paragraph in discussion. And since you're not gonna have space to discuss literally everything that you found, pick those things that are most prominent. Now I've said here cherry picking, you know, it's possible, I'm working with a student right now who did a summer, an interesting summer project uh, related to family planning. And, you know, not everything in that paper was consistent with our working hypothesis. In fact, most things were not consistent with our working hypothesis, which is completely fine. That's why you do that work. But you don't necessarily have to point out every single thing that blew your, your hypothesis or that makes your point. Highlight those things that matter most. And, and that's master the art of cherry picking. I'm not really describing it as well as I want to here, but let's go ahead and go to the next slide if we could. So as I mentioned a moment ago, that sort of first paragraph should really 
be tailored to your your largest contributions that this study makes. And if it's you know if it's in the Journal of Public Health Management and Practice, it's going to be for practice. And this may become something that gets repeated later in policy implications for practice and policy. But it's still the thing that you may want to be. And, and again, don't be concerned that you just did that in the results section. Well, you didn't highlight necessarily that this is important. In the results section, you mentioned it. In the, in the discussion section, you're pointing out what's there. And then you're going to mention why that's important. That's the contextual aspect of the discussion that's so crucial that's not part of the methods and results section. And, and again, the practice lens is so important, that translation lens. It's often helpful, I think always helpful, and this is what you know, end, you know, end notes are about. You wanna compare what you've learned through your study with what others have found who have done something similar. So it may not have been about hepatitis C, it may have been about simply injection drug use. I'm thinking about a paper some colleagues and I uh, published in, in this journal. Uh, but that may give the context. Similar findings in preventing HIV also may make sense for how you prevent the spread of hepatitis C or vice versa in that. And so you want to place them in the context where you're finding similar to that of others who have done the same kind of work that you have done. And if not, what do you think the reasons for that are? And if they are similar, it strengthens the findings that that trans relational finding, that thing that we do in practice gives you a fairly consistent result. Now, when you're doing the results section or, or you know, writing and drafting the results section, you are just giving the facts. And I call that the dragnet model. So those of you who don't know Henry probably don't know Joe Friday. And Joe Friday, when interviewing a suspect or a witness would say, just the facts, ma'am. That's what the results section is. It's pretty mundane, boiled down to just the facts. In discussion, you get to talk about why you think the facts are the facts. And that's the value and importance of that discussion section. Okay, and again, the cherry picking, the less substantial findings, you know, address them if you have space to do so. So again, if your length is only the same length as your results section, you may not have space for all of them. Hit the ones that you think are consistent with what you believe to be your major findings that are the most important. Uh, and make sure that even if you have that space, that you don't mention so much in the discussion section that the reader is lost to what your salient, essential, main bottom line points are. Don't get lost in a myriad of detail about other things. If the context is mutually reinforcing, all the better. Okay, next uh, slide, please, Don. Okay, so this is extremely important to me, and I realize I should have said this in my perspective. So I do suffer from a major disability. Uh, I attended law school in my sordid and distant past, and having written legal memorandum which are among the most droll and deadly things in the world to write, I used to write them with flourish or flair to make them more interesting to me. Well, that really translates into the discussion section of our paper. It doesn't have to be dry. It can be provocative. And there should be an element in it, too, of speculation. Why do you think the findings were what you found and why? You can't go beyond uh, what seems reasonable, but speculation, the discussion section is the one place that that should fit. And for us, since we're talking about practice, what are the implications too for practice? Why might it matter in the type of practices that you study? And I think it's also important to be provocative, particularly if you found something uh, the unexpected, or something that's really important for your field, make that, underscore that point. And to me, it makes for much more interesting reading. Um, 
and the whole practice, public health practice universe, these translational findings are so huge. Mention in your discussion section. And then again, you have the layer policy and practice bullets that you have to include in a journal of public health management and practice paper. Those things may be duplicative, it's okay, but it should at least foreshadow those things. And also, where do we go from here? You know, so as someone who does research for a living, it's almost always there's another study that's needed. But it, it shouldn't just be there's another study that's needed. It's what do we need from another study? We may have done a cross-sectional study. So then we need to do something else that moves us from associations to something resembling causation. And, and I've said here, there are relatively few silver bullets in our profession. In fact, pretty much any profession. So when you're doing your work, be sure not to imply causation when it isn't uh, in fact present. If you've done uh, hypothesis generating uh, or you know, types of studies rather than hypothesis, hypothesis demonstrating, you've got, you've got to actually make those points. Okay, so next slide, please, Donna. All right, there is a limitation section in, in, the, um, in the discussion, and it can be a separate section or heading. It can be in nearly the last paragraph of that of the discussion. And here is when you talk about why your study wasn't perfect. And do this from the standpoint of there is no perfect study. I've not seen one. You've not seen one. So, but you should be reasonably straightforward and honest about what the limitations were. And, you know, uh, at the same time that you mention what might be limiting about your study, you also want to be able to touch on the strengths. So, yes, this paper was limited by the fact that uh, you know, it was a convenience sample or that was cross-sectional. And yet the findings that we had were consistent with other investigators. The sample size was ginormous. We had longitudinal data over multiple years that were all consistent. That our, our findings were, you know, highly statistically significant and they're generalizable to other populations. So that's some of the art of while well, underscoring the weaknesses in the limitations section, not failing to mention the strengths that your study does bring. And again, this should be a paragraph and it shouldn't be, you know, every possible limitation because uh, there are always going to be, as I mentioned, uh, imperfect studies. And this is generally for me, the paragraph that comes before the conclusion. Um, next uh, slide for us, please. So again, this is an opportunity much like that first paragraph that you had in the discussion section, but this is the one or two sentence takeaway that you want your reader to have. And typically it is a separate paragraph. Uh, it may or may not be a separate section. This should be very concise and to the point, and it might be telling them also the next place you want to go, even though we mentioned that earlier, you know, more research is needed on why, uh, you know, metropolitan health departments are doing blah, 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 as opposed to smaller rural health departments. That's probably a terrible analogy, but there we go. So there's uh, next slide, please. So, you know, when you're ready to do something with this manuscript you have, you should be thinking about submission. And when you're really doing your homework, you're thinking about submission before you ever start preparing the manuscript. And I will be honest, sometimes I do that, sometimes I don't. But how you write the paper may well be influenced by, influenced by where you are hoping to publish it. And so you need to be familiar with not every journal in public health, but rather the journals that are consistent with your interests, that where you think you want to be publishing. And so if you don't know that already, then go to some of those journals and their websites, look at their most recent, art, um, most recent issues and examine the table of content and see if it really is what you think it is about. And I would look at, if you see papers on things that you too would like to be publishing on, 
take a look at how they wrote at that particular article. Look at the style, the format, and you know, think about using that in, in some way as a guide. Uh, I also suggest, you know, almost every place you want to be publishing is publishing online right now in terms of submitting your article, not your article necessarily being only uh, on the web. And I'm going to suggest that you prepare by going through the various steps that you have to do as, as an author to be sure that you have all the sections prepared. There's going to be many things that are called for, like a letter uh, to the to the editorial staff that goes with your paper. Uh, there may be word limitations. You want to know what those are. There may be particular key words, and you want to have already developed those things. So, and there may be format issues. Forever as an editor, I was receiving single spaced papers when the guidance was clearly double spaced. I hate single spaced papers. Uh, I want that space between them, that white space, so I can think better. You may argue whether that's really correct, but it helps me decipher that article better. And I recommend doing a mock run of submitting your paper before you're actually ready to do that so that you can, again, be sure that you have all the required elements that are necessary. Uh, Don, can you have the next slide, please? So there's also, once you've sent your paper out and if all things go well, it's gonna be reviewed by two to three reviewers, depending on your journal and the type of article that it is. And you've gotta prepare, there's much like there's no perfect study, there's no, uh, there's no perfect paper. Uh, you wanna be able to, uh, you're gonna to expect to get feedback from a reviewer. That's what they do for a living. And so when you're responding back to the reviewer, your tone should always be reverential, respectful, polite, uh, replete with many thank yous for making that key, uh, pointing out that key issue for you. And you can use a lot of different formats. I tend to respond to point by point. Now, often reviewers will give you a paragraph of stuff and you've got to pull out the individual points that the reviewer is making. That's fine. Uh, but as I'm putting down the points that the reviewer makes, I'm giving my response below it. If I'm putting theirs in italics, I put mine in non-italics so that they're offset. Colleagues of mine use tables. So table is you know, the reviewer comment followed by on one side, the, the author comments back. And these are things that are usually done by the person who is the, the respondent, the corresponding author in the paper, with input from others. And I always suggest submitting both a clean version with all the corrections and changes you've made for the review and one with track changes so the reviewer can see all the changes you have made. When I'm responding to reviewers, I tell them precisely the language that I've modified. So they're not hunting and pecking, trying to find it to be sure you actually did do what they said, what you said you did. So they're not, uh, again, you want to make this as easy for the reviewer as humanly possible. When it's easy for them, they will tend to look upon it far more favorably for you. Okay, now remember some things about the reviewers. They have the last word. That's why that reverential, reverential and polite, respectful tone is important. The rough rule of thumb I use, and I'll be very interested in hearing from my colleagues, is that you need to be take very seriously three quarters to 80% of the comments that the reviewer has to say and respond to them in, a, in some way that you've considered those things very carefully. Um, and that leaves you room to say, well, you know, this is a study that wasn't designed to do that, or that's not the key point that we wanted to make but you wanna pick your battles. It's not gonna be everything they say and bear that in mind. And you know, and this is even recognizing that quite frankly, some reviewers are expletive deleted, expletive deleted, expletive deleted jerks. And because they're cloaked in anonymity, they can say a lot of things about your paper that they would never say to your face. That's just, that's just, the world that we, we live in as people who submit articles. But again, if you follow those rules of thumb, I think you'll 
generally speaking, do well. Uh, next slide, Donnie. And I want to refer you to something, uh, a paper by a gentleman named Welsh, and point out this is about medical article writing. And I don't, public health writing and medical writing are not the same, and nor should they be. Medical writing is far more succinct, very much to the point, incredibly droll, but there's some things that you can take away from what Welsh suggests that I think are profoundly important in writing in any scientific discipline. And so this is the name of the article. It's a six page article. I think there's some great stuff in there. So uh, one of the things that I think the point that uh, Welsh makes extremely well is being concise and succinct. And quite frankly, I don't see enough of that. Learning to write concisely and succinctly isn't, is, requires a lot of repetition and practice. Public health tends to be not nearly as concise as succinct as medicine, and that is fine. That's one of the values of our discipline, but there are often far more words there than need to be there. You can always add words, but start by being concise and succinct and make your major points. There was one other thing I wanted to say about Welsh, and that is that Welsh suggests, and I didn't make this point here, I should have, get your colleagues and mentors to read your paper and give you honest feedback. And so, you know, that's what peer reviewers are going to give you honest feedback, whether you want it or not. But you're having colleagues or mentors who can read it for you and really tell you whether they're following your arguments well and whether you've made your key points, I think is invaluable. And let me show my last slide and hope I'm not going over time here. I think I'm going to be good. So this is one of the tables, uh, apparently table two from that Welsh article. And it's, it's essentially all the things that we just discussed in one table, the value of tables, right? So your very first thing in the discussion section should be restate your finding. What, what was the key thing that you just found? And we talked all about context. Place this in the context of what others who have done similar work have found or in a related field if no one else has done this work. Uh, I'm less gonna talk about could it be wrong, but that's basically the limitations. What are the weaknesses of your study? Uh, and be honest about those. I think it's important to be honest, but don't fail to mention the strengths of the study too, so that they're able to place those things in context. And finally, what does it all mean? That's that conclusion section, but it's part of the discussion as you're, you know, as you're making it. It becomes part of your conclusion, and it also becomes that policy and practice implication set of bullets that the Journal of Public Health Management and Practice asks for you to include. So I want to stop right there and turn it over to Dr. Leiter, and uh, I'm looking forward to hearing some of your questions as well. Thank you, Les, and sorry about my webcam. Let's see if it decides to turn on. Uh, th thanks to both the speakers for walking through these considerations. Um, I, I sometimes find the discussion section among the, the hardest to write, but also the most interesting because it lets you really complete your story, right? You've, you've framed it in the background. What's the need? What do we know? What must we do or learn? Methods and results will we'll show you that, and then discussion lets you complete that. Admittedly, this looks a little bit different depending on the kind of paper you are writing. So if you do a more traditional research report or a research brief uh, type approach, that, that I think falls in line. If you do a more kind of practice-oriented brief um, or, or full practice document in the various journals, you're oftentimes talking uh, less about, um, say, methods and results for a study you did and more about um, an activity you performed or service you delivered and the outcomes of, of that. So how these differ in the discussion is, is really what are you able to say, um, what next steps are for a research type uh, manuscript versus a, a policy um, or practice brief can look very different. And I would say that for practice, um, practice briefs, practice reports, especially uh, the, the discussion should be much more heavily on, on the implication side from the get-go. I, I would say maybe there'll be disagreement from our, um, our other speakers. This can be modulated a little bit by the fact that different journals have different norms, standards, and expectations. 
And when I was getting started in all this, I, I sometimes found it very difficult uh, why different kinds of journals had incredibly different kinds of papers, different, uh, just even syntax diction, how things were communicated. And so to use the example that, that Les talked about earlier, if you think about uh, the medical or bio biomedical journals versus say the public health and other social science type journals, it's, uh, it's really different how you approach problems, how you write up your methods and results, and especially the discussion section. I would say in policy and public health practice type journals, discussion sections are much more orientated around uh, sure, highlight what you found, what you think is the most important, the most salient, but really talk about what does this mean in the real world. Um, and I, th I think that's a major difference between the, the say, natural sciences and biomedical journals and uh, public health and social science journals. Uh, as was talked about in our very first webinar, there are components of submission that people sometimes uh, don't do justice to. And, and first and foremost is the cover letter. So almost every journal when you submit will ask for some kind of brief introduction separate from your abstract, separate from your paper um, for the editorial staff to review as, as they're making their kind of desk decision. Am I going to desk reject it or send it forward for peer review if that's appropriate for the paper type? So a cover letter is incredibly important. And, and during our discussion, I'd invite our uh, our speakers to talk about their experience with cover letters. But for me, um, this is how I speak directly to the editorial staff, the associate editor or the editor-in-chief and say, here's why I think your readership might care about this. You know, please consider what we're talking about. So that means even if you only have 150 words, you should spend your time to craft those carefully. And as uh, Dr. Bites said, doing a test run can actually be really valuable. So what do I mean when I say test run? And I, I assume Dr. Bites, you mean the same. I'm getting into the editorial system, seeing what kinds of documents or content you need to have ready to submit. Do you need to know information about your co-authors? Almost certainly. But are there forms that you need to sign, sign um, now versus later? Different journals have different standards and almost every single one will have um, a four authors or an author's guidance section. And those will highlight it, uh, what, what you need to do. But honestly, not until you get into the editorial management website, do you really know what a submission requires. So with that, uh, let's move into a question. Oh, I'm sorry, forgive me. Um, one of the, the last things we wanted to talk about, Justin, um, was uh, especially the practice and implication section. So right before we move into Q&A, can Justin, you please talk about how journals are now highlighting practice a bit more than they used to? Certainly. So, um, you know, some journals and JPHMP um, is one of them uh, use call out boxes, but we're not the only one. There are other journals that, you know, have a so what section and ours is called implications for policy and practice. And, and there we have a bulleted list of kind of, okay, I'm, I'm skimming this. Maybe I don't have full time. What is really the take home message here? Um, so they're kind of meant to stand alone, but they're also meant to highlight and really bring the relevance out. And, and we, we added it in consultation with um, an advisory board of practitioners who said, you know, um, we really want you to encourage your authors to think about practice relevance. And one of the things I say very clearly in our guidance to authors is that if you cannot articulate the implications for policy and practice um, clearly, we're probably the wrong journal for you. And uh, you know that's one of the ways we really put a point that um, this should have some um, you know applicability to the to the real world. Other journals use special article types. Like we we have um, four main article types. Um, you know we have brief reports and full reports, and then we further differentiate those into a research brief report. You know our practice uh, brief or full report. Um, other journals, um, for example, American Journal of Public Health. Um, you know, one of the examples for them is they have uh, notes from the field, uh, but they have a lot of other designations that uh, bring your your um, bring the reader to, hey, this is going to have a more applied um, uh, focus to it, uh, and other journals uh, as well. And some are are um, very exclusively focused on that. Health promotion practice would be a good example. Um, uh, next slide, please. So if you would like to see some of the resources that will help you with everything that we've been talking about today, uh, some of you have seen this before if you've been on other webinars, but we do have author guidelines for our journal. Uh, they are specific to our journal. Um, 
And, uh, but, you know, they do have some uh, general, uh, generalizability. Um, we have author resources um, out there, how to write various sections. We have general writing resources that are a little more broader, not just for journal writing. And then we have a writing and boxes um, e-learning module uh, that we uh, developed, which will actually, uh, it's an interactive uh, presentation that will help you um, frame out your uh, manuscript. And you can do that um, as a team as well. Um, and we hope in the next year to launch uh, an online uh, scientific writing course. So please stay tuned for that. Uh, next slide. And with that, I'll hand it back out to uh, JP to uh, field uh, Q&A. Great, and I'll invite all of our speakers to turn on their mics and video. We've got about 10 minutes where I'd like to do q and I invite you to put some items um, on your mind into the chat. We'll get to everything that we can. Um, I'm gonna start off with a question, um, Oscar, for you. As you think about the guidance that, that, that you offered and, and that uh, Dr. Beitch offered, could you think about how this differs if you're writing a research type paper uh, versus a practice um, type paper or practice type brief? So um, to the extent, uh, as with anything, you have to, of course, know what the journal of the publication requires, what they've published in the past, and how it best suits uh, the content of information that you have uh, to, uh, to be, I guess, created. So whether you're looking to write a research brief or, or whether you're looking to do a full, you know, blown manuscript, whether it is a, um, you know, different, different journals have uh, different ways of, I would say, encouraging the types of um, data that you want to put forth. So uh, I guess the robustness of the information is going to really value, or I should say, uh, be a greater value in this in making a decision as to the type of submission that you're looking to accomplish. So uh, I would say it's based both on the, the information you have, the strategy, or I should say the guidance from the, the journal that you're looking to submit, and also the type of information you really want to get out. A research brief, it's, it's as it sounds, is going to be very short, maybe, you know, just in time collection or collection of data uh, that may uh, provide you with a, you know, a, a, a short outlook, uh, whereas uh, you have a much more retrospective look of, you know, if you invest of maybe about three, four years or a year in an intervention strategy and your data and your evaluation, you know, provides that, uh, that, that, that um, substantial girth uh, to what you're submitted. So those are the factors that I would say uh, will really play a role um, in differentiating between uh, what you submit for those three types of uh, opportunities. You know, I, I have to say, I, I really agree. I think that um, life can feel pretty complicated when you're, when you're looking at these various kinds of formats at these various kinds of journals. And you can start by asking some questions, right, which, which we talked about in previous webinars, like, am I trying to describe um, a, a practice or policy that, that's been employed? Um, am I trying to conduct some kind of inferential uh, statistics, draw conclusions, do some kind of like longitudinal analysis? And, um, you know, when you're in the research realm, you, you know, really understanding the methods and the approach and even how to discuss it, I think is, is challenging. But even for practice briefs, Oscar, just like you said, it can be really hard. It depends on, on what you're trying to get across so the, the, the program or, or policy you're, you're talking about. Um, so, so actually, let me, let me throw this to, to Les, to you. When, when, you were, when you were a peer reviewer, when you were the, the associate editor at, at AJPH, did you have a different mindset when you were looking at uh, discussion sections for a research type paper versus a, a practice or, or notes from the field or um, practice brief report type paper? That's, that's a great question, JP. Uh, you know, first of all, the, I was also a department editor, and so I was a department editor for policy papers. And uh, that was, I actually created that department and then got to be editor for that department after I'd been associated for a while. And so I really liked those papers a lot. And you actually summarized, I think, very well when you were talking about the difference between natural sciences and, and social sciences and public health. And so I want to underscore those comments that you made, but it is it, the, the beauty of those papers is to take, uh, again, the, the narrow research findings and then highlight the policy implications and how policy might be changed to get us to a different place you know, in terms of a better health outcome 
than what you may have found in your paper. So, you know, I personally saw those things as being very different and the opportunity to really take a, uh, to take a little bit more of a leap, if you will, but one that was logical and founded on policy principles. So, you know, policy is more interesting to me. And again, you know, that's why I went to law school several, you know, centuries ago is because those policy things really matter to me. And so I love reading uh, a policy paper where people have done research and then they're trying to really connect dots on what policy changes, what processes might be altered to get us to a different outcome. Thank you. Um, I'd like to move to another question. This one for you, Justin. Uh, we have a question in the chat from Jean who said that uh, they're getting together their first submission to JPHMP and they're feeling a little uncertain about the cover letter. Could you talk about, oh, you already beat me to it, Justin. Um, could you talk about a cover letter, what to leave in, uh, sorry, what to, to keep in, what to leave out? And then I, I invite you to talk about the blog post that, that I know you did on this. Sure. Um, so, you know, cover letters, uh, are, are much more important than I ever thought they were when I was first starting out. Like I, uh, as it was alluded to in, in the discussion, I, um, you know, I, I think I glossed over it. I was like, hi, this is our paper, read it. Let me know what you think. Um, but, you know, as a, an editor of a very diverse journal, I have no ability to be an expert in everything that even I cover. Um, our editor in chief, um, farms out, you know, things around uh, health behaviors to me. But, you know, so, but that can be a lot of things, right? I'm not a tobacco researcher, uh, for example, but I handle all our tobacco submissions. Um, and so sometimes it's very important for you to articulate uh, very succinctly what this contribution brings for someone who's not an expert in your field. You know, because editors, by definition, you cannot be an expert in everything. And so, um, you know, say, uh, you know, this was the first, um, this is the first paper to show the effectiveness of a statewide, um, you know, smoke-free policy in bars, you know, which might've been a paper 20 years ago. But, you know, because I don't necessarily know that um, as an editor. So I would just be very clear. It's your chance to brag. You don't get to brag in a manuscript. Feel free to brag in a cover letter. Now, don't go crazy. You know, this is the end all be all of human civilization is not appropriate either. But, you know, let me know what, if this really is the first time something's been reported or demonstrated or implemented or, or what have you, um, take the time to say that. Um, it's also a good time if, if, you know, you're in a very narrow area. Uh, we, don't, we don't require that you recommend um, reviewers, but if there are in, reviewers independent of your team who um, have expertise, um, in an area, especially if it's very narrow, um, you know, it, it's a time to recommend those. Um, it's, it's also a time to um, maybe uh, identify individuals who shouldn't uh, review. And, you know, not this person is a bad person, but more, oh, so-and-so was a consultant on this early work, they would not be appropriate. And there's no way you can know that they are in conflict. So I wouldn't reach out to them. Or you could say this group has you know, um, a very different approach on, on the way we do this. And there's an ideological issue there that should be considered, um, you know, that, that's appropriate. But I think most importantly, it's a chance to say, we did something really cool that the world needs to know about, and here's what that is. Thank you. All right, so we're almost out of time. I have one last question that I'm gonna ask each reviewer to give me two sentences on. Uh, or each speaker, I'm sorry, to give two sentences on. Um, I'll go first. The question is, what's the best advice or request you've gotten from a reviewer with respect to the discussion section? Best I ever got was maybe 10 years ago where somebody uh, essentially said, don't uh, tell me what you found, tell me why it matters. And that's always stuck with me. I'll pop over to you, Oscar. What's the best advice or request you ever got from a reviewer with respect to a discussion section? On the discussion piece, it was actually ironic, I think. Uh, one of the best uh, responses that I received was, um, how, well, when we think about practice, it, it's, it's 
take that from theory into practice. It's, it's kind of, I'm really, I'm really, uh, you know, capturing, uh, you know, a more succinct way of what the, what the point was, was that in the discussion area, we were just talking about, well, in, in, in this theory, it's this, like, no, take it from theory and put it into practice. And I think that was, uh, it was very welcoming because it, it, it put us back in our normal way of doing business versus what we thought people wanted to hear. Thank you, Oscar. Uh, Les, lightning round to you. Yeah, so those are good comments from both of you. So for me, it would be connect the dots. So, and, and it was make it, be sure that all the things that you include in the discussion section of why you think it's important are logically flowing. And so we found A, and we think the policy implications are blah, blah, blah. You've got to be sure that you make that logical nexus very thoughtfully, not just that leap because as Justin suggested, not everybody is the expert in that topic area. So you've got to lead them there. That's part of the storytelling role. Mm -hmm. And last word to you, Justin. Mine was uh, very early on and it was simply don't overstate your results. You can make an incremental contribution. You don't have to act like it was the greatest thing that you've ever done. Um, so you know, stay within your results and don't overstate them. Thank you. All right, Donnie, back to you. All righty. Well, thank you all for all of that wonderful information. And for everyone that joined us today, just want to um, let everyone know I put the link for our evaluation in the chat. We'd appreciate if you could fill that out, give us some feedback so we can continue to provide these great trainings for you moving forward. And uh, I think with that, we'll end here for today. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Happy publishing.